Let's dive in. Saints, not sinners. Our behavior does not determine our identity. I love what um, Russ read. Uh, Isaiah, what? What was that, Isaiah? 25. 25. The two key words with the banquet. It'll be wine and meat. Yes. Choice wine. Choice wine. So last time I talked about saint and sinners, and I mentioned I had a wine, and I only have two bottles left. (laughs) <laughs> but this was called Saint and Sinner, and it's a Shiraz Cabernet. They don't make it anymore. Ugh. Um, but I found out something fun, so that it, you're a saint when you're sipping, but you're a sinner when you're chugging. So anyway, it's a, it's a very, very nice blend. Um, Shiraz Cabernet is surprisingly good. And so anyway, um, I had to show it to you because I told you about it last week, and my wife is just going, come on, move on. All right. Let's get into this. Things that made me ponder this week, and I got some deep ones. Um, I had a whole bunch more that I couldn't add because there's just too many, and uh, you'll, you'll find out next week. This is from Dr. Carol, Caroline Leaf. Sometimes you need to burn bridges to stop yourself from crossing them again. I thought that was good because uh, we talk about don't burn your bridges, but some for your own mental health need to be severed. I love this one too. Jesus spent his whole life engaging the people most of us have spent our whole lives trying to avoid. This is about the love of God. The more I grow in my understanding of what the love of God is, that Jesus is love, that God is love, that the Holy Spirit is love, it's really shaken up my previous thoughts of compartmentalism, of us versus them, and it's reminding me of our union with Christ, all of us, and it's quite beautiful. I love this from Brad Jerzak. Uh, there was an argument this week. Somebody was asking, do I, did any of you still read the Bible? And Because this is in a deconstruction page, and um, uh, I comment and share this post, but some people try and pendulum swing and just say, we don't need the Bible anymore, and I, I think it's brutal. But the Word of God is infallible, inerrant, and totally inspired. And when he was about 18, he grew a beard. The point is, the Word of God is not the Bible. Don't kid yourselves. If that's a shocker for you for the first time, the Word of God is a person named Jesus. He is the Logos, the living Word, the representation of the Father, the one correcting our concepts of who we think God is. The written Word is a small w, and it's a record of what has been inspired. I think it's inspired, but still, it, this is more accurate if you're going to use that terminology. I thought that was good. This is a bigger one from C.S. Lewis. The real Son of God is at your side. He is beginning to turn you into the same kind of thing as himself. He is beginning, so to speak, to inject his kind of life and thought, his Zoe life, into you. Beginning to turn the tin soldier into a live person. The part of you that does not like it is the part that is still tin. I thought that was good. I would correct it and say, God's not at your side. Christ is in you. That is accurate far more. But this is a lens that was written a long time ago, and it's still really, really good. Next one. It is only and precisely because God has already forgiven us in Jesus Christ that we are able to repent. For it is the goodness of God, his eternal disposition towards us, that leads us to repentance. I used to share this at funerals, that it's the love of God, it's the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. I forget who the artist was. I think it was Sheila Walsh, um, who sang, it's your kindness that leads us to repentance. Um, I, I... I sang it, I knew it, but I didn't understand it with the lens I have now. Now I'm realizing, wait a minute. Instead of pounding people, telling them how terrible they are, how bad they are, how sinful they are, how separated they are, tell them how much God loves them. That's a little more enticing. It's a lot more true. And this is how the love of God works in us. 
And when you believe it, it changes you from the inside out. Unlike my upbringing where I, had, I was told, God's going to get you if you don't listen. <laughs> my mom threatened me with that so many times. Anyway, Brad Jerzyk writes, this is another really good lens. The river of fire that flows from God's throne is heavenly or hellish, depending on one's orientation to love. Infernalists forget that the furnace of divine love is also infinitely effective, melting every icy delusion that hardens heart to perfect love. I love that. (laughs) That's for another sermon. One day I will get to the sermon on hell. (laughs) Love. I choose love. I choose inclusion. I choose empathy. I choose compassion, equality, dignity, diversity. I choose community, kindness, integrity, honesty, respect. I choose justice. I choose facts, peace, the planet. I choose humanity. I choose love. In this topic of love in our culture, there's no mention of God there, but it is our humanity. And since we have learned in Colossians, Christ holds some things together. No, Christ holds all things together, whether they're aware of it or not. This fits. Almost done. If love can change God's mind and Jesus changes the meaning of the Bible because of love, ooh, carefully hear that, we should be open to the same. Perhaps love should change our minds and our beliefs. Perhaps love should change how we read the Bible. And this has been happening to me for probably 10 years, I'd say a good 20 now. That seeing and reading the scriptures, your lens matters. And the stuff I was taught in Bible college, there were some good parts there, but I forgot most of it. And when I went back and relearned some of it, and when it comes to the study of interpretation, hmm, there actually were some good things. Brad that last one. I think it's the last one. If there are cracks in the foundation of one's faith or culture or politics, it makes sense to dismantle the broken bits of the faulty floor. But how the foundation gets renewed deserves focused attention. I wouldn't trust my family's well-being to those who've not thought past the demolition phase. <laughs> I really like that. Looking forward to hearing him on Tuesday. Devotional from Henry Nouwen. I love his stuff. I was uh, preparing this morning, getting the PowerPoint ready, and I came across another one already. So I have next week's ready already. It's like, oh my goodness, that's so good. So this is going to be fun. But this is really great. Claiming the light. People who have come to know the joy of God do not deny the darkness, but they choose not to live in it. They claim that the light that shines in the darkness can be trusted more than the darkness itself, and that a little bit of light can dispel a lot of darkness. They point each other to flashes of light here and there and remind each other that they reveal the hidden but real presence of God. They discover There are people who heal each other's wounds, forgive each other's offenses, share their possessions, foster the spirit of community, celebrate the gifts they have received, and live in constant anticipation of the full manifestation of God's glory. That's good. How's that for your intro? (laughs) Wow. Wow. Well, I want to dig into this saint and sinner stuff because last week we were talking about uh, the process of All Saints Day and uh, the history of Martin Luther. And Martin Luther posted a proposal on the doors of the Church of Wittenberg, Germany, to debate the doctrine and practice of indulgences. This proposal is popularly known as the 95 Theses, not Reese's Pieces, but which he nailed to the castle church doors. 
So this, is, this instance sparked a major shift and a shakeup in the church. And we've seen more and more shakeups over the years. So don't be afraid of shakeups. The truth can stand up for itself. It can withstand every question. We need not be afraid. He called these out with conviction after deep study. Too many people are calling out false doctrines. They call it false doctrines. They use the word heretic way too freely with a a quick Google search on the topic. That is not deep study. I remember a person I was mentored by had spent years studying a topic before they came out public. And that taught me something. It really did. There's, there's got to be a process to hash it out so you're not just reacting and responding, which is what social media does. Social media is not the place to get your theology. If you haven't learned that yet. He also did this with clear arguments. It wasn't, this is how I feel. It wasn't about feelings. And he clarified, he was very, very punctual about what he was talking about. With the purpose of having the debated in the room. Them, oh, sorry, oh, having them debate. Sorry, yes, thank you, thank you. I was, like, what, what was I trying to say there? I was typing too fast. But he was up for debate too. He put the theses on the door so that it could be dealt with, so that all could wrestle with it. Do not be afraid of reading something counter to what you have believed and heard. Oh no, I just trust Jesus, I don't want any of that. Well, that's nice, but that is pablum, baby level, child level. You're supposed to be mature and growing. It's time to grow up. Don't be afraid of that. And the beauty of the community, and I love our, our, our fellowship here, we have freedom to have conversations over coffee in a group or whatever. We have sessions sometimes where we just talk through some stuff that's tough to talk about. But trust has been built before we hit those topics. And then we get to converse and even ask the, oh, can I even ask that question? And they ask. And it's like, oh, okay, let's talk about this. That's the safety of a community, not social media. There is room even today for meaningful debates, study, and dialogue. This is how we learn. This is how we grow. All Saints Day. All saints. I put the all in capitals on purpose. Because my hope is, if I can, if I can remember to do this right, next week I'm hoping to get into the word all again. It's been years since I talked about that word all. Who's included in the all You'd be surprised there's debate. (laughs) But this is about saints. So what is a saint? Last week we talked about how we got to All Saints Day. Now let's talk about definitions of saints. Because there are multiple definitions. I want to share some with you. So just so you know where they're coming from. So one definition is a person acknowledged as holy or virtuous and typically regarded as being in heaven after death. So you're not a saint until you get to heaven. That's one concept that is floating in the church, just so you know. Another idea, in the Catholic and Orthodox churches, a person formally recognized or canonized by the church after death who may be the object of this and the prayers of intercession. So sometimes they even have, the person has to do a miracle from being dead. How do they verify that? But anyway, it's just, There's a lot going on with naming saints. So in some circles, you use that term carefully. The saints are only those who've gone before and have done great things and are considered holy. Another definition, used in titles of religious saints. You know, Saint Augustine, Saint Paul, Saint Peter, like that stuff. So we're familiar with that one. Another one. Alluding to biblical use, a Christian believer, oh, the poor saints which are in Jerusalem. So it's just a term. It's just a nice add-on. Uh, yeah. And then we have the informal. It's a very virtuous kind of patient person. She's a saint to go on living with that man. <laughs> it's usually done in, jo- in jest. But the idea of, oh, look at what they're doing. They're such a saint. So their behavior 
the term saint is associated because of virtuous behavior. All right? So you can see how that can trickle into your definition of saint. But how many of us trust our Bibles? At least the general understanding of it. I do. There are contradictions in our scriptures. Absolutely, yes. Anybody that tells you differently uh, has not studied and is ignorant and is stuck in a small cubby hole and needs to grow up and shouldn't be teaching. There are contradictions there. 63 times some translations refer to all of us as saints. We are all saints. We don't always act like it. Uh, Ask your family members. (laughs) They'll confirm you don't act like a saint all the time. But if that term is going to be used by the Apostle Paul more than anyone else, we need to understand its meaning a little bit and look at where in Scripture it's coming from so it's not just me saying it. Don't trust me. Trust the Holy Spirit guiding you and listening to you, questioning things. The Bible speaks the truth about us regardless of what we feel or how we behave. This is a tough one to swallow because many folks, they will say right away, but that's not how I, how I feel. And they really live heavily from feelings. I used to dismiss feelings big time because, ah, that's just what you're thinking about and your body's responding to it. And there is truth to that. However, when you use the term, this is just how I feel, sometimes the word feeling just means that I haven't grappled with the theology behind this, or I don't understand it, I have questions about this topic, so you use the term feel. So it's not authentically a feeling, but it's just a loose term. But listen, our behavior does not determine who we are. So when this term saint comes up, um, or sinner, we, the church, the Western church loves to be focused and they're obsessed with this thing called sin. They really are. It's like sin, 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 sin. And you wonder why there's a lot of sin, because they're planting seeds all over the place. But anyway, um, the whole idea of being called a sinner versus a saint. Paul, and they'll use Paul. Well, Paul calls himself a sinner. Well, does he? He doesn't really. The text you're thinking of is when he says, you know, if you're going to use the term sinner, I'm the champion of sinners. I'm the one, if I'm going to boast, I'm, not, I'm no great person. In fact, I'm, I'm the chief of sinners. It's like Muhammad Ali. What's his nickname? He's known as what? The and champ, right? The greatest and the champ. They always call him the champ. So Muhammad Ali could say, I'm the champ. Well, I saw him do that on TV once, but his body was doing this thing, and he was having a hard time speaking clear. I think he was wrestling with Parkinson's disease. He was having a hard time. I can take him out. I'll go in the match with him. I I could, I won't, but. (laughs) I'm just giving you a picture, okay? So here he is. He's the champ. That's his title. Is he? Could he be a champ? Not, no. But the fact that he was the champ, that was the title associated. Paul was saying, if you're going to try and, and claim something, look at me, chief of sinners. I have messed up. I was living in a way extremely contrary to God's grace. And what happened on the road to Damascus? Something profound happened there. A light came Blinded him, and a voice was heard. And later we hear that, what did Jesus do to Paul the apostle? He revealed what to Paul? Anybody know? Uh, Sorry? Definitely revealed the mystery, but what what was the words Paul would have said? It was the grace of God that revealed Christ in me. Not to me. We always were taught that Jesus came and presented himself, and then Paul accepted. Didn't happen. Jesus revealed his life already in Paul. 
I'm not making this up. Ooh. Hence, Colossians, the secret. Shh. It's no longer a secret. Christ in you, the hope of glory. <laughs> Hence, his terminology. By the way, he then went and studied for three years. But wait, he had already passed. He was already on the way to becoming a great Pharisee. He was on his way to become a very well-known, pronounced person. He knew the scriptures. He knew all of it. Three more years? Are you kidding? Ooh. Some of you go, yeah, I love studying. We're great. That's nice. But he did. Three more years. Romans 1.7. I'm going to read this from a couple translations. To all who are beloved of God in Rome, called as saints. That was the term for the believers. Not because of what they did, because who lived in them. And they recognized it. Another translation, the First Nations version. I love how they say this. They don't use the word saints, but they also change a lot of words. It's beautiful. I write this message to the ones who live in village of iron, Rome. You are all deeply loved by the great spirit and are called to be his holy ones, saints. Same word. I send you, sorry, I send to you great kindness and peace from our father and creator and from our honored chief, creator sets free, Jesus, the chosen one. I find it interesting, it says here, um, the holy ones. I remember growing up, trying to become holy. I read books on how to be holy. And I loved it, because it told me what to do. I didn't have to think. It was awesome. I was growing, I loved it. And by the way, that was part of my journey. And it's okay. Which was baby steps to what I see now that I already am holy. I never knew that. But when I discovered I was already holy and was already a saint, only then was I able to begin to act like who I was. Do you remember my watch story from a number of years ago where a guy gave me a watch at a conference? Yeah, and uh, this is not it, but uh, I enjoyed it. It was a really nice watch. Uh, I wore it for a year, battery died. I was building a shed and did some gardening and all that fun stuff and wrecked it and Went in to get the battery changed at the cheapo place. And the cheapo place said, no, we can't do that. you got to go to a jeweler. And my inside voice says, what? You're incompetent? Oh, okay. And then what do I do next? <laughs> so I went to the jeweler in Elmira, and I told him the story. A guy gave me the watch, and he's looking it over. And once he heard the guy gave it to me, I could see a look on his face. I said, why? Is this a nice watch? I said, well, yeah. And he says, look, it's a Movado sapphire crystal watch and 14 karat gold. Apparently it's nice. And I said, oh, um, what, what do you think it's worth? He said, oh, when this was brand new, it was, it was approximately $2,500 to $3,000 for this watch. Would you like a new band with that? And do you want me to clean it up? Yes. <laughs> I never wore that watch gardening again. I never wore that watch during renovations. Why? Tell me why. Why wouldn't I do that? The value, sorry? The value. I know it's value now. Did the value change or did it suddenly become valuable when I was told? Mm, good question. In my mind, it suddenly, instantly became valuable. And yet in God's mind, it was always valuable. I was always valuable. You have always been valuable. Once you believe it, your life, your thinking will change. Not because of anything you do, because your mindset shifts from not good enough to worthy. And that feels weird sometimes, especially if you grow up believing you're unworthy constantly because of all the negative voices that have been plaguing you. Then you find out you're loved, <laughs> accepted. Then you don't do some of the things 
that you used to do because now you know your value. But sometimes it can take the rest of your life to believe that value. That's what I will share for the rest of my life and all I teach and do. Who you are in Christ. Who Christ is in you. And who we all are in God. That's a three-point sermon right there. The mirror translation says it like this. In addressing you, I address all in Rome. I'm convinced of God's love for you. He restored you to the harmony of your original design. You were made holy. Were, were, past tense, were. Historically, past. You were made holy in Christ Jesus. No wonder then you are surnamed saints. Love that. His grace gift in Christ secures your total well-being. The Father of the Lord Jesus Christ is ours also. He is our God. That is amazing. Romans 1, 7, small notes, because he writes notes. It's like the Amplified Bible on steroids. <laughs> it's kind of what it's like. The word kaleo means called, identified, surname, surname, all that stuff. He separated me from my mother's womb when he revealed his son in me in order that I may declare him in the nations. Immediately, I did not consult with flesh and blood, Galatians 1, 15 and 16. He revealed his son in me. This is the revelation I was talking about. You want to know the reference? There it is, in Galatians 1. That's where Paul declares what was revealed to him on that road. And then in 2 Corinthians, from now on, therefore, we regard no one, no one, from a human point of view, even though we once knew Christ after the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. The flesh, behavior, activity, ego. We don't regard and know everybody. The labels that we used from ego are unacceptable for true identity. Your true identity is saint, holy, in Christ, beloved. That is your true identity. I know in our culture we got identity issues. Let me make this not about gender. This is about spirit. That's a whole different topic, and that's a tough one to deal with. But we are spirits having a human experience in these bodies, in these earth suits. And there's a union in our body, too. Sometimes we say, well, my body is different than my spirit, you know, blah, blah, blah. Well, I'm finding union in everything now. <laughs> it's really cool. Ephesians 2, 8, 18 to 20. For through him we both have access to one spirit. Oh, boy. Um, the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles, the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. Ephesians 2 from the First Nations Version. I'll close with this because I, I can't finish which is fine, but uh. I love this First Nations translation for what I'm about to read. I added a couple more verses from the beginning to the end to capture the essence of it, and I think it's beautiful. Even though we behaved like enemies, we are now friends with the great spirit and with one another. When creator sets free, Jesus, died on the cross, those things that made us enemies died with him. That's big. That's really big. We are now joined together as one people in one body. He brought this good story of peace and harmony to people who were far away from him and to people who were close to him. Because of him, we both have a clear path through one spirit to the Father from above. Now, we are all his holy people and members of one 
new nation. No one is on the outside of this great family that our Father is creating. We are all related. This is pretty good. This is next week's sermon. We are all related to one another and initiated into Creator's Lodge that is built together with wooden poles. The message bearers and prophets of old, Creator sets free Jesus, is the main pole binding us together. This is a beautiful image. Like branches being weaved into his sacred lodge, joined together in this way, we become, we become, we become a dwelling place for his spirit. The spirit of Christ lives in you. Go read this in another translation, because this is fresh, this is different. If you've never heard this before, it's like, whoa, whoa. That sounds a little bit like my Bible, but it's different. Yes, we need to read this from different perspectives. Hmm. I, I just, yeah. so, oh, really? Okay. <laughs> Shh. Don't pause on the video to see what those were. <laughs> Let's pray. Heavenly Father, will you reveal Christ in us to each one of us? If you've already revealed yourself, Maybe some have forgotten. Will you re-reveal or remind us of your presence in us? May our minds believe this so that our actions reflect the love you have put into us. I pray this in the precious name of Creator sets free, Jesus. Amen.